Good morning, everybody. Great to see you today. Uh, welcome everybody in the lot. Make sure you stay hydrated. Walk out there to a bunch of skeletons. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> Only 111 today. I uh, want to give a special shout out to those from Phoenix Rescue Mission that are joining us online as well as our larger online community as well. Great to have you guys with us. Um, as Pastor Chris said, want to just say thank you so much for those of you who grabbed a a wristband with a student's name on it from last week as you left the service and you prayed over our students. Uh, my daughter went to camp, had an amazing time. Thank you for being a church that prays. We believe that prayer will and can accomplish anything that God wants to accomplish. So thank you for partnering with us in that. So many amazing stories have already come out. And the students will uh, take over the service two weeks from now. So you'll, you'll hear more uh, from them as well. We've also got a group from the church that is in Sunny Slope this morning, and they're feeding the homeless, so we want to say hi to them too. Um, you know, and, and just a, a quick word about that. As God continues to add to the breadth of those who call Illuminate Community Church their home, you know, the second service is feeling a little tight sometimes, and one way to alleviate that congestion is to have you sign up and join the church in a different location in Sunny Slope and be the church on a Sunday morning. Uh, maybe once every other month or something like that, just to free up some space here in the second service for those that want to join us. We're just super thankful for all the ministry opportunities that God has blessed us with uh, here at Illuminate. So like Pastor Chris said, we are in Acts chapter 9, so if you got your Bibles, you can go ahead and head there. And here's what's going to happen this morning. We're going to read a story, true story, about a man whose life was turned upside down in the best possible way. His name is Saul. A little bit of background about this guy is pretty interesting. He lived in the first century AD. He was a religious zealot. He was a Jew who believed that the Messiah was yet to come. And so when Jesus comes on the scene and he says, I am the Messiah, he's like, no, you're not. You're a heretic. More problematic is that many of his followers are being very vocal. They're advancing the cause of Jesus. And Paul is kind of out of his mind. I'm going to use two names to refer to this man, Saul and Paul. Saul is the name that he's referred to before he encounters Jesus. His life is turned inside out, so much so that he's actually referred to by a different name moving forward, and that name is Paul. So Saul and Paul are the same individual. So... Saul is committed to putting an end to Christianity. In fact, he's so committed that in Acts chapter 7, we read that he oversees the death of the first Christian martyr. He takes it upon himself to single-handedly seek and destroy anyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Christos, the Messiah. At this point in his story... He's gone to religious hierarchy, and he has asked for official papers to carry out his terrorist mission. He receives them, and he's on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus. And then something happens that changes his life. Chapter 9, verse 1, but Saul, still <sighs> breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He wanted them dead. Anybody that claimed to be a follower of Jesus was a target. So he goes to the high priest. He's like the guy who's in charge. He makes all the decisions. And he asks him for letters. He's, he says, can we make this official? Can we make my mission official? You give me the proper letters so that when I go from synagogue to synagogue, I can say, here's why I'm in town. I'm looking for those Jews who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus as the Messiah. Aren't they deceived? They're following a heretic. He asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to, this is a great phrase, the way. Early Christians were referred to as the way. Why? Well, in part, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So this has to be stated. Jesus left no other alternative 
There is no other path to God except through Jesus. So in our time, super popular to say something like, listen, it doesn't really matter who you believe in or what you believe as long as you are sincere. Well, you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong in what you believe. So for example, um, what's on the buffet? You've got Jesus, you've got Muhammad, you've got Confucius, uh, you've got the Buddha, you've got Gandhi. Does it really matter? Does it really make a difference? I mean, they all seem to be pretty good moral teachers, right? I mean, they've certainly become famous and made names for themselves. Uh, they've all started causes, some religions, world religions. Just pick one, just pick one. Because, right, essentially all roads lead to the same place, right? They all believe in a heaven. Here's the challenge. If you're thinking critically, none of that makes sense because every single individual mentioned describes a different way to heaven, a different way to God, whatever their God is. Uh, so the law of non-contradiction tells us that we can't all be right. We can't all be right. So now the question arises, well, what sets one apart from the other? That's an easy question, and that question should be asked if you're thinking. The answer is simple. Which one came back from the dead? Okay, there's your winner. And so what's interesting in the life of Saul is that when he has this radical conversion to Christianity, what he sought to kill, he becomes. It's kind of crazy. Something must have happened, okay? What's interesting is that he doesn't really share his testimony. He will at times, but what he leads with is the Bible. See, testimonies can be subjective, but when you take the Bible and you reveal things like very specific prophecies mentioned hundreds of years before Jesus fulfilled them, you're kind of left scratching your head, going, okay, now wait a minute, I have to deal with this. So there's no other worldview, there's no other faith system, there's nothing that comes close to Christianity. Don't let anyone ever tell you that Christianity is a blind faith. It is the furthest thing from the truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, look, I've dropped a lot of information on you. Here's the most important thing, that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day, and all of this happened according to the scriptures. This stuff was prophesied before. So what we're reading is just the fulfillment of it. That's all. And if we're not talking about Jesus, I mean, the specificity of these things are so detailed. If we're not talking about Jesus, who are we talking about? So this is what Paul begins to lead with when he comes to faith in Christ. Um, so these early followers were known as the way because Jesus laid it out there. I am the way to God. So men or women, doesn't matter, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And what this would look like is you drag them out of their homes. Hey, are you one who belongs to the way? And now the pressure's on. Yes, put these chains on and follow me. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. And suddenly, there's this light that shines around him. And there's a voice that speaks to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I don't think there's anger in this voice because Saul's name is repeated twice. There's emotion. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul replies, who are you, Lord? So he recognizes he's in the presence of something greater than himself. And then the voice says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So at this time, there were hundreds of Jesus running around, hundreds of guys named Jesus running around. But there's no further explanation needed. Paul knows exactly who he's speaking to. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. So the men who were traveling with him, they stood speechless. They heard the voice. They didn't see anyone. So this is... Uh, this is Luke's way, the author, of saying there were eyewitnesses there, okay? This didn't happen in isolation. This isn't something he just fantasized about and made up. There were eyewitnesses. Saul rose from the ground. Although his eyes were open, he couldn't see anything. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and he didn't eat 
or drink. All right, so here's this guy. He's uh, full of anger. He's hostile. He's violent. He really is, in every sense of the word, a terrorist because he's bringing terror into the lives of Christians. And he has this radical encounter with the resurrected Jesus, and things begin to change. He moves from being angry to being uh, sensitive. So let's just talk about anger for one second. Anger will keep you from seeing Jesus for who he is. Anger will keep you from seeing God for who he is. Um, What is the cause of most of our anger? Blocked goal, having some desire not met, and it can be material or immaterial. Uh, We all have this fierce desire to be loved, uh, to be respected. And so when that's threatened or when it's taken away from us, what happens is there's this emotion that rises up within us. And it can be consuming. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? You and I know that some of the most painful circumstances we bring in, into our own lives are a result of what happens when we act out on our anger. And uh, yeah, how do you deal with that? So it's fascinating because this same man will, years later, he will write to a group of believers living in the city of Ephesus, and he makes this statement. It's as if he says, I know all about anger. I'm like, I was like the poster boy for anger. So here's what I'm saying to you. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. That's really wise. Because what he's saying is, anger has this way of rising up. It's never static, it's always dynamic. And if you don't deal with it quickly, it's gonna eat you up. The bitterness, the resentment, the hostility. And then you know what he says, the very next statement he says, if you don't deal with it quickly, here's the outworking. He says, you're going to give the devil an opportunity. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever thought about your anger in that way? You're a puppet in the hands of the powers of darkness because of your anger. You think you're in control. No, you're being controlled. So here's this guy who's taken from anger to a place of I can't see. I can't, I don't, I can't, I need help walking. And so if Jesus says, all right, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you three days in total darkness to think about this conversation, to do nothing but, nothing but think. And so he's so disturbed by it. The text says he doesn't eat or drink. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. God speaks to him and says in a vision, Ananias, Ananias says, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision you, a man named Ananias, come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, Ananias isn't dumb. Saul's reputation is so far and wide for being this beast. He says this, But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard a lot about this guy and how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. This is a bad guy. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the, wait for it, Gentiles. Gentiles, non-Jews, they didn't get along. We'll see this more next week. They hated each other. Gentiles viewed Jews as nothing more than slave labor. Jews viewed Gentiles as dirty, unclean pagans. And now, what we're learning is that Paul's mission is to the very people that he would never, ever associate with. Maybe God would say, go reach your fellow Jews with my message. But now he's saying, you're going to go to those who formerly you despised. And again, marching through the book of Acts, what you see is God doing something that no one expects, but he's doing exactly what the world needs. Because through Jesus, all these diverse people are being brought together. 
And again, the world had never experienced anything like it. That's why in a little bit we're going to read that in the city of Antioch, that was the first city where they were first called Christians. That's significant because Antioch was one of the most culturally, ethnically, racially diverse cities in the known world at that time. And so you have all these people from these different ethnicities and races coming together and people are like, we have no explanation for this. We have no word to describe what's happening. Well, the thing they all have in common is that they're followers of Jesus. So let's call them little Christs or little Christians. And it and it's beginning to happen now. But this is blowing everybody's mind. And it's going to take something supernatural like this to happen. By the way, as you, as you move through the book of Acts, the miracles become fewer and fewer. Because now it's on the people of God to advance the mission through their holy lives. That becomes the attraction. So the miracles are becoming fewer and fewer. But it takes a miracle like this for everybody to go, could God be serious about building this family wherein everybody's welcome? No matter what your background is, it's exactly what he's doing, and he's going to prove it with Paul. You're going to go reach the Gentiles. Uh, it's just nobody sees it coming, and, uh, and yet it's happening. He's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel, for I will show him how much he's going to suffer for my name's sake, the one who caused my people to suffer is going to become one of my people. And now he will do the suffering. Because Jesus says, when you persecute my followers, it's as if you're persecuting me personally. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And at this moment in Saul's life, he's, experienced, he's experiencing something he's never experienced before. And if I were to put it in one word, I would use the word broken. Anybody in the room ever been broken? Oh, y'all are way too pent up this morning. <laughs> Give me a break. Be real. Three specific circumstances in my life where I can tell you I've been broken. One, as a result of my own stupidity, right? I brought it into my own life. But as we've said many times, life has a way of taking things away from you and bringing you to that very low place where you're like, I, it's really, I don't know. It's hard to deal with. I can't make this right. I can't restore this. I can't undo this. I'm not sure what to do. This is some deep pain. This is some real heartache. Uh, what's the point in all that? Well, the text tells us. Because Saul was so full of himself, as I was back in the day, and by the way, my human tendency is to continue to be that way. But it's really hard for the Spirit of God to fill you when you're full of yourself. And so when you're broken, there's these cracks that appear in the best possible way because you start to become empty of who you are so that God can fill you with who he is. And that's exactly what happens in Saul's life. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. I said it last week. If you read through the New Testament, there's no such thing as an unbaptized believer. People come to faith in Christ, bam, they're baptized almost immediately. If you haven't been baptized, you have some unfinished business with God, call the church. We've got baptisms coming up. Takes food. He's strengthened. Saul asks two very important questions. The first one is this, Jesus, who are you? Second question is, Jesus, what do you want me to do? Now, if Jesus was to appear today, I think most people would ask him maybe, maybe a question like this. What is the meaning of life, Jesus? It's an important question. Jesus would answer that. He can answer that. He'd say, well, the meaning of life is to take my life up into your life. Then you will discover the meaning and purpose of life, okay? So actually, I am the meaning of life. Or another question, uh, popular question that might be asked today is, hey, what? It doesn't make sense to me. I mean, if there is a God and that God is good, then why do innocent people suffer? Jesus would be like, I can answer that question too because I played that role. And what happens is God takes the suffering of the innocent up into his greater purposes 
so that there can be something revealed about who God is in his goodness, his kindness, his grace, and his mercy because God will use the innocent to redeem the fallen. That's how good he is. That doesn't happen without the example of Jesus. So those are important questions. But there is a more pressing question for humanity, and it is this, and it has to be asked. How can I be saved from the judgment of God? That's the question that needs to be asked. How can I be saved from the judgment of God? Because God is holy and just. He won't turn a blind eye to all the wrongs that you have done, nor me. He just won't do it. He can't do it. He's bound by his nature. He just can't do it. It has to be dealt with. So, Jesus, who are you? Well, I'm the one that took the wrath of God toward you upon myself so that you can be spared. I take all of your junk upon me, and in return, you get eternal life. Great deal. It's a good deal for you. Accept that one. Don't pass on that. And what do you want me to do? Take the blessing that you've been given and be a blessing to others. Now, for Paul, it's going to get pretty gnarly um, because he's been told, you're going to suffer for me. I, you know, I have this theory. Um, I'm pretty certain it's true. If Paul were to remove his shirt and expose his bare back to you, it would be grotesque. You'd be horrified because it would be full of scars because that's the rest of his story. He's getting beat down and he's kicked out of the city, thrown out, and it's like he's dusting himself off. And he's like, all right, guys, we're going back. And he goes right back to where God calls him. The guy's a savage for the gospel. You don't get there without being laid low and broken. So if brokenness is coming into your life, accept it. Embrace it. And his life begins to transform uh, from the very beginning. Verse 19, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. That's significant because it's freaking people out. He goes, he's in the synagogue and he's going, Jesus is the son of God. And people are kind of out of their minds. And all who heard him were amazed and said, wait a minute, wait a minute time, time out. Isn't this Saul? Isn't this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, like to harass Christians to bring them bound before the chief priests? Do we have the right guy? Is this the right guy on the brochure? You know, you can imagine Saul's coming to town. This is a big deal in some of these towns, man. They, this, is, this is news. And so all these good God-fearing Jews, they're filling the synagogue and the place is buzzing. And then Saul gets up and they're like, what's he going to say? And he says, I'm here, yes, to tell you, yes, that Jesus, yes, is the Messiah. What? No. This is the wrong Saul. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus. Look at this. By proving that Jesus was the Christ. That's a strong word, that word, prove. Prove. How do you prove Jesus is the Christ? Saul did it back then the same way I would do it today. So his context is the synagogue, so here's how it goes. He stands up and he says, hand me the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. And he goes to what we know now as Isaiah 53. And he begins reading through, which is a crazy description of how when the Messiah comes, he's going to die for the sins of the world through death by crucifixion. And yet, crucifixion hadn't been invented by the Persians, let alone perfected by the Romans. But it's in the text. And then he says, you know, hand me the scroll from the prophet Ezekiel. And he goes to what we would know as chapter 36. And he says, you know, God spoke about a time when he, when he was going to remove the heart of stone that's found within his people and replace it with the heart of flesh. Well, Jesus is the one who comes and he does that. And then he says, okay, okay, let's, what do you want to listen? Hand me the scroll from, from the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah talks about how one day God would be extending his family to all people, all nations on the planet. And it's like, well, this is what Jesus is doing right now in our midst. And then he would say, you know, well, hand me the scroll from the prophet Micah. And then he turns to Micah chapter 5. What we know is chapter 5. And he's like, now you see how it says that from the little town of Bethlehem, one will come forth who will be a great ruler and nation and leader. That's, that's Messiah language. He's saying the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Go fact 
check it in the first century. You can find Jesus' genealogy. That's where he was born. This is why New Testament authors, when they start saying, hey, let me tell you about my encounter with Jesus. But before I tell you about my personal experience, can I just tell you about his ancestral lineage? Because it's right in line with what our scriptures say about a forthcoming Messiah. Proof. Proof. It's provable. So if you deny it, you are not being intellectually honest. So if there was ever a guy that one would, people would want to take down in this time, it's going to be now Paul's own people because he's a traitor. But I want you to see something. Paul is becoming a sanctified version of himself. Let me explain what I mean by that. This is a guy who's zealous. He's super passionate. You know, you just picture him speaking a million miles an hour and he's devouring the scriptures and he takes all of that and he redirects it towards the things of God. Formerly, it was how can I disprove Christianity? And he used his intellect, his passion. He becomes a believer. None of that stuff is taken away. He is who God created him to be, but now it's directed in the right place. See, what happens is people will come to faith in Christ and they'll think, now I just got to change everything about me. Well, there are some things morally and ethically that we want to bring under the lordship of Jesus Christ, but you know, God created you very uniquely. And I want to tell you this very, very clearly. Understand this. No one can be you better than you. So please be yourself. Be the person that God created you to be. So you might say, well, I'm super extroverted. Awesome. Be an extroverted, sanctified version of yourself. You say, I'm more introverted. Praise God. Be an introverted, sanctified version of yourself. All of the things that made Paul unique are now being used to advance the kingdom. And it's true uh, with you and me. Uh, But Paul will be preaching change. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, just a few years uh, after this encounter with Jesus, he he writes, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So to be a new creation is something that is, um, it's, it's actually quite, it's more radical than you realize and it's super relevant for our own time because today people will say, just be true to you, right? That's kind of the mantra. You know, just be true to you. And, you know, I I understand what's being said there, but the Christian interprets that through a different lens because now the question we're asking ourselves is, well, Jason, who are you going to be true to? The new you in Jesus or the old you before you knew Jesus? Yeah, be true to you, but be true to the new you, the one that's been renewed and restored and redirected and redeemed by Jesus. And this is exactly where Paul is at. And so... It's, uh, it's super compelling because, again, um, he says, look, in this growth process, we're all somewhere. And for those of us who think that, um, you know, we might be above others in, this, in the family of God, let's just, uh, let's just be real and bring it down to this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he goes on, he gives a list of things to define what unrighteousness looks like. And before I read the list, I just want you to know that there's something in this list that gets every single one of us. Do not be deceived. See, that's the thing about sin. Sin makes you stupid, by the way. Um, It just does. You're, you're You're deceived. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters. There you go. We're all done right there. We're, we're done. I mean, just, just the idea of idolatry. It's true that our hearts are like little idol-making factories, and we'll take good things, good things, and elevate them to the place of supremacy above God. That's idolatry. Nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. You were that way, but you were washed. You were sanctified, you were set apart, you were justified, you were put in this right relationship with God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. In other words, he says we were all formerly somethings. 
Every single one of us has done something to put Jesus on the cross. So Saul appears in the synagogue and he's preaching. People don't like it. They oppose him. Verse 23, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. This many, phrase many days can refer to actually a long period of time. Galatians chapter 1, Paul says that he spent some time in Arabia before he went back down to Damascus. Some commentators think that he was gaining more knowledge in who Jesus was during that time. But verse 24, their plot became known to Saul. Now Saul understands, hey, my Jewish brothers, they don't like what I'm saying. They want to kill me. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. As soon as he leaves that city, he's dead. But his disciples, interesting, he was already making disciples, took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. He's going to need a little encouragement. Where do you find encouragement, Christian? In the Christian community. You go to your fellow Christians, verse 26, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they're all out of their minds. They're afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Can't be. There's no way. This guy's too far to be saved. But Barnabas, whose name Bar means son of, the ba, Abbas means to encourage. So literally, he's the son of encouragement. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, these are the Greek Jews, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And Paul will become the greatest church planter the world has ever known. The rest of us who planted churches, we bow down to Paul. We are here in large part because of his zeal and his commitment. So a couple of things to take away. Number one, understand that religious zeal does not save you. Religious zeal does not mean you are going to heaven. What gets you to heaven is Jesus, period. So Saul was the guy that, you know, he was in synagogue constantly. He was tithing on top of his tithes. Right? He held fast to all Old Testament law, and he wasn't saved. He wasn't going to heaven. Why? Because he didn't know Jesus. This is what Jesus said on the cross, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane before the cross. He's like, hey, is there a plan B? Because I'm not thrilled about being crucified. So is there any other way to provide salvation for mankind? And then he says, not my will, but your will be done. So the answer comes back, no, there is no other way. If there was some other way to get to God other than through Jesus, that was the moment to have that question answered. Secondly, understand that God forgives any repentant heart. Look, we live in a time where we are not only affirming, but we are celebrating what is uh, just depraved. And so what's happening is really interesting. You have people who are involved in things, again, for which the world is encouraging them to get involved in, and they're becoming unwound. And sometimes it takes a few years for this unwinding, this trajectory to fully land, but when it does land, it doesn't land, it's not landing well with people. I'm just telling you, people are not finding life in these things. They're having their lives taken away from them. It's not giving them life, it's robbing them of their lives. And yet we keep encouraging things in all the wrong directions. And people today can be led to believe, yeah, but you don't know what I've been involved in. You don't know what I've pursued. You don't know what I've engaged. God could never forgive me. Okay, Saul was a murderer. He sought to kill Christians. And God said, you're mine. And he experiences grace, mercy, and forgiveness. It could be that you just need to focus on being more of a sanctified version of yourself. This is the answer to the dull Christian life that you've been living. Let me say that again. This is the answer to the dull Christian life you've been living. God created you for the purpose of serving him. And when you step into that, you begin to experience the life that he intended for you to have. That's the life of meaning, purpose, order. I'm going to tell you, adventure. 
And then there may be some in the room who, you know, the reality for you is, you know, it's just a season of brokenness for you. And what I would say is, you know, don't resist it. Embrace it. God wants to use that brokenness as a prelude to this amazing filling in your life. I know it's hard. I know it's painful. It's not always easy. But you know, at one point the Apostle Paul will write to his younger protege, Timothy, and he will say, comfort others with the comfort you have been given. There was a time in Paul's life when he needed a lot of comfort and he got it from God, from God's people. He says, you're going through what you're going through so that you in turn can be a blessing to those around you. You can come alongside someone and say, I know what it's like to be sympathetic. I'm empathetic to you because I've been down that road. I have been through that valley and the text does not say God will lead you around the valley of the shadow of death. He will lead you through it, which means it's going to be dark for a while. And you just don't know how long that valley is. But the psalmist says, God is right there. So you look forward to that. You certainly never asked for it, but you look forward to coming through. And then God says, great. Now, that test is part of your testimony because there's always a test in the testimony. So if it's a season of brokenness, although difficult, embrace it. So Father, it feels like every week we open up the scriptures and we get such deep truth. We, we don't get this kind of uh, challenge from the culture. These are words that lead to life. And more and more, as these words are spoken, I really believe they are resonating with people because of the deep lostness. People are searching for life rafts. They are searching for the way out. It's no coincidence that Jesus described himself in the exact manner that people need today. So, Father, as we leave this place, will your spirit impress upon each believer here what it means to be a sanctified version of ourselves for your glory. And for those who don't know you, God, keep drawing them in, not here by accident, not exposed to this text, these words, but all within your sovereignty. God, continue to work as only a supernatural God can, all for your glory, so that the name of Jesus can be made famous and can be made known, not only throughout the valley, but throughout the entire world. That is the name of Jesus Christ. And God's people said,